Hello, everyone. Today, I'm here to talk about how HashiCorp does community management. First things first, pretty big elephant in the room. I am going to talk about open source. I understand that we are not an open source company anymore, but I have been here six years. More than five of them has been working in open source. And everything we've learned, despite um, what license our software is under, is going to apply, whether it's open source or business source. So we will talk about both. And I hope, I hope, I hope, regardless of where, the, where you stand on this, that you will learn something and that it will be helpful to you. So please keep that in mind. All of these lessons apply no matter what your license. A few fun facts. HashiCorp actually still does a ton of work in open source. So we have over a thousand repositories right now in our organization. 11 of them are under the business source license, which is still freely available to use for most use cases, but also um, still worked in the open. So it's still open. Um, so you can download the code, check it out, see what's in it and all that stuff. We're still working transparently. Um, and then the other thousand plus are um, open source licenses of varying degrees. So all of these, all the information I'm about to share will apply to both and we'll tell a little bit of story about some of the um, ones that may be your favorites. So hi, I'm Melissa Gurney Green. I run the community team here at HashiCorp. I am an infrastructure engineer with a passion for building communities. I've been at HashiCorp, as I said, about six years now. Um, I was a co-host on Speaking in Tech. I'm actually kicking that back off here soon. I was also a co-host on Tech Vines. I am very active in my local community as well, both in terms of AI and robotics clubs, but also in terms of scouts. I'm a scout leader as well as a former Little League umpire in chief. So I know a bit about building non-technical communities too, and I'm very active. So if you have um, exciting community lessons to share with me, I'm happy to, to sit and chat with any of you about this. Let's dive right in. So how do you even start? <laughs> Not everybody's MVPs are going to be the same. So when I when I say MVP, I don't mean most valuable player. I mean um, minimum viable product, and that's going to be okay. So each product project you have is going to have a purpose, and and counting yourself out from the beginning is not the way to go. So you can sit and think to yourself, but hey, what if somebody already built it? Well, cool. You have a couple options. You can still build your own and learn some things. And with that, you can get started and do your thing. And then when you've got something that kind of works or you've got further down that path, you can go and check out the other thing and then start to ask questions. And what you'll see is not all projects, even if they solve the same problem, are going to ever be built the same. So you'll have the chance to compare code and go, hey, I wonder why they did that there. Or, hey, I chose this way because. And, and you'll start to get some learning even from just doing that. Next question, what if you fail? Well, everybody fails if they don't start. So get started, try. Even in failure, you're gonna learn something. And that learning is gonna be important for the next thing you try to build. So just start it off and see where you go. The next one is, what if people go crazy and then see my work isn't perfect? Well, if those people are worth your time, then congratulations, you have a community. These people will come in and they will help you and they will they will ask you questions and, and engage with you and try to make your code even better, which is awesome. We have a lot of projects here um, at HashiCorp that started this way. Um, one of my favorites is Shipyard, and that is still used by the DAs today. It was built by the DAs, the developer advocates here at HashiCorp. And what it does is it helps us build demo environments and create a consistent experience, but it also has some built-in documentation with it. So you can use it at a customer site or in talking to a practitioner to help them spin up a proof of concept real quick and give them a quick reference without them having to search all over the place for the documentation they need. A lot of fun. Others kind of purpose built from the beginning, just in case engineering chose to adopt it. And one of my favorite one of those is the Terraform operator for Kubernetes that was actually built by our developer advocate team here at HashiCorp as something that we thought the community needed based on feedback, based on 
using the tools ourselves. And we said, if we're right about this, we want to build it in a way that will make it for our engineering team to easily adopt and maintain. And that's exactly what happened. We built it. We kind of went a little crazy. We started getting community reaction and community response and engagement and got to the point to where we could justify creating a whole engineering team around it and handing it off to that team and helping them build um, even better products for all of you. So in terms of measuring and engaging at this stage, when you're in that early stage, what are you really focused on? A lot of people are like, ooh, downloads and stars. No, those are fluffy things for keynotes, y'all. You don't want to pay attention to downloads and stars at this stage. Because think about it. How many times have you gone to something and downloaded it or started it, especially starring it, never to touch it again? Y'all, I've done this so many times. <laughs> so, so don't feel bad, but then don't count that as your win, because that's not your win. Your win is feedback and questions and people opening issues and PRs and asking for examples. So so getting this kind of engagement is really key, especially early. And you want to be fast as far as getting answers to these people early in the process. So right now we call these projects that we start that are at this stage um, community projects. And uh, I understand that's a loaded term now with the community edition, but we classify them internally as community projects. And what we mean by that is that they need a faster response time. They need a response within three business days. And we work to try to get that response because we want people in close. And when we start one of these new community projects up, we work to have a developer advocate or somebody in the engineering team be an advocate of the community and work with the community directly to understand who's using this, how are they using it, how can we make it even better, are we on the right path to building this thing right? And that's super important. So um, that's that's our method of, of trying to kind of incubate an early project and get adoption and get the support from the community that we need to, to put even more effort behind that project. So what does this look like as a company? Well, um, when you're a company doing this, you're taking your first step in building a company tech community, and that starts with a DevRel function. Now, that doesn't mean you go out and hire a DevRel tomorrow or hire a developer advocate tomorrow. That's not what it means. What it means is you hire engineers that can be a little social and that understand that in order for this to take off, you kind of need to share what you're doing with the world and get that feedback and have those conversations. And that feedback doesn't necessarily always come wrapped in the nicest words, right? So, so figuring out a way to um, have somebody that can do that for you early is key. Next important thing is establishing a code of conduct. So when interactions happen, especially online, they can be a little spicier than, um, than in person. And that's just the nature of being online. But that doesn't mean you want to start your community as one that's going to be a spicy one. So you want to have a solid code of conduct that establishes rules really early for how you want the community to interact and, importantly, how they should expect you to interact back with them when they break those rules. <clears throat> a lot of this for us started as DMs and chat servers. So having people reach out to us directly or having a chat available to where we could reach out and interact with them and answer questions. Mailing list came shortly after so that we could have a documented, somewhat searchable way of helping people out. We added a conference at this stage. Not everybody does. It's not mandatory. But for our users, in-person engagement was really important, so we did. And user groups as well. So we have a massive user group community here at HashiCorp today, and that's because we started them early and encouraged engagement in person early on, and they grew a lot, and they're still growing, and we're thankful for them. So shout out to all our hugs out there. Thank you, leaders, for all you do. Um, we were also, at the same time that we were running conferences, building an education team and docs folks, and this could be a whole talk on its own, but it's important to realize that writing good, understandable documentation 
is very hard as a software developer or as somebody who's an advocate who's going out all the time. When you're using the tool all the time and when you're building the tool, you're not necessarily the best person to write the documentation for the tool because there's a lot of things that you'll just skip in your head. And there's a lot of things I just skip in my head just talking just now about all of the work that goes into this stuff. And um, and for us, it became apparent really early that the best thing we could do is create a whole team that's just laser focused on this and just building the best possible documentation we can and that team still works very hard to do that for the community. So if you have feedback on our docs or on our education, please reach out to us. We are happy to hear from you. Um, and then lastly, forums. So we went from DMs and chat servers and mailing lists to forums pretty quick. And with good reason, it's because forums are way easier to search and way easier to address repeat questions than it is in a DM or a chat server or things that are less searchable like mailing lists. So it's an important thing to consider up front when you're considering what your community should look like is as it grows, when do you implement these things and how do you implement these things? Things to watch out for at this stage. Number one is toxicity. The community will do what you show it. And if you show it that you tolerate people being toxic, both publicly and privately, they will react in kind. So going back to that community guidelines or that code of conduct, seeing how people engage and engaging with them back and understanding sometimes that frustration is human. <laughs> so, so reaching out to them and saying, hey, the way you're engaging here is not okay. I'm happy to help you, but please don't do that. And calling it out both publicly and privately and trying to work with people is very important. Setting those boundaries, whether they're boundaries around behavior or boundaries around the time you spend, are very, very important. So getting that going, the community will see it. They'll understand how to engage. They'll understand that you're serious about your code of conduct. And it's very important to address toxicity up front. As far as boundaries go, you can extend those boundaries to how you're working. And it's very important to establish boundaries in how you want to work and what you wanna do based on your own approach to community, your company's approach to community if you're doing this as a company, but also just for your own sanity to prevent burnout. So if that's taking nights and weekends off, taking nights and weekends off. If it's saying, hey, I'm gonna take a vacation, great, take a vacation, communicate that out if you feel the need to, but, but don't just dive in and keep diving in, get some help. <laughs> And boundaries can help establish that help for you. So as things get bigger, you face bigger challenges. And sometimes you need a bigger boat. So um, that happened with us with Terraform pretty early in that we found that Terraform got too big too quick. And what I mean by that is, is the core repository had all of the cloud provider builds built in. That makes for something that's very heavy and not very modular. But it also means that some people are getting a whole lot of software that they don't need. And any change to that base software gets a lot more complicated a lot more quickly. So what we did is we broke out all the contributions to the individual cloud providers and made them their own things. And we kept um, just the essential bits to run Terraform in that core repository. And what that allowed us to do is um, is be very intentional about how we manage each of those projects. It also made Terraform a lot more lightweight so people could get the bits they needed. It also allowed us to apply different community strat management strategies to each, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. Around this time, you're also going to want to think about contributor programs. And what I mean by this is finding those people that keep coming to you and contributing code or documentation or asking questions to help you think about use cases and ways in which your stuff is used and how it could be better used and how people really want to use it. And anybody that's contributing to your code or docs at this point um, and doing a good job, you should definitely find a way to celebrate them. Now that could be as little as a thank you or a, um, or a shout out in the release 
or it could be something where you send them thank you gifts and and whatnot we have the core contributor program now where we where we celebrate these people once a year but also engage with them and ask them questions about what they'd like to see in the tools they get they get a bigger seat at the table than than any user of terraform because well terraform is an example but any user of our tools because they've helped build the tools so giving them that and, and giving them a voice is super important to us now there's more than just contributing code and documentation there's also influencer programs so this is about the time that we built the ambassador program and we were thinking about ways to engage with people who are sharing their experiences and their learning with people out there at large in order to help them be able to use our tools better so thank you to our ambassadors today i know we're we're in the middle of voting for our next round but um but these people are also important and they also deserve um, a chance to give product feedback and to hear what's coming in the product down the road and and we offer that to to the people who are actively out there trying to help others learn our tools um another thing we considered at this point was virtual community conferences um welcome to all of you who are attending hashi talks today and and hearing this talk live um this was a labor of love over the past few years at the suggestion of one of our favorite community members so um so this is when we added them for um for hashi court what does measuring and engagement look like when you're facing these bigger challenges well, a lot of the times when we think about these things at the emerging stage, we think about issues and PRs and time to first response. I know earlier I said three days was um, was the amount of time that you should take max to respond to one of these things. Well, at this point, because the projects are bigger and there's a lot more users and a lot more things that can go wrong and a lot more complexity and technical debt and all of that stuff, really what you want to think about is um is trying to get back in seven to ten days and there's a reason for that there's code reviews there's roadmap things to think about there's there's a lot more going on so you can take a little more time to respond with the number of requests coming in and everything else another thing you're going to want to look at is the number of repeat quality contributors and this is going to be an indicator of health in terms of people coming and trying to keep engaging with you because those people are actually using your tool in the day to day and they actually care about how it grows and how it changes um number of attenders number of users attending conferences and user groups are also another thing to to kind of think about at this stage um in terms of of measuring engagement and understanding how big your community actually is um building out some more rules and some more parameters around contribution so things like contribution and issue and pr templates um contribution guidelines and style guides and stuff like that becomes super important um but also consider putting out an sla for response so some kind of service level agreement so that the community understands that you're going to take a little more time to respond to this or this is the time in which they can expect a response which is something that we haven't done yet but it's definitely something we've considered and something we're still considering from time to time we also at this stage moved to something called upvote driven development. <laughs> and what I mean by that is specifically in the cloud providers, we have millions and millions of users and the cloud providers are creating new features all the time. So this thing that we have that's labeled bug in this, in this repository could be used by a thousand users, could be used by two. Um, so what we do is we use upvotes as an indicator of how popular the issue actually is so that we can prioritize the right things to solve the right problems at the right time for the people with the limited time we have. It's another way to kind of keep sanity. So, so that's something that we've considered and moved to. It's all, also maybe time to consider upgrading your advocacy model. So around this point, we increased our number of VAs, but we had about six products to support um with those six products it's really hard to keep track and find somebody that knows all six it's even harder once you find somebody that knows all six to have them be able to keep track of all of the changes in all six when you have engineering teams actively working to update them 
very, very quickly, very, very regularly. So we went to what was called T-shaped developer advocacy to allow for people to, to engage with the tool they were strongest in, and then learn a lot about the tools that were adjacent to that and how they were used and how they integrate together, but still have that very strong specialty in that one tool and attend all the meetings for that one tool so you know where all the updates are and you can update others. Things to watch out for at this stage, um, you're gonna start to see tests in your community culture. And what I mean by this is some of the things that you're that you're managing against in community will always be there. You'll always have to deal with some level of toxicity in the community. community. Um, but what really makes a difference here is you'll start to see if you did your work early, your community will start helping you manage the community and manage this toxicity and say, no, we don't do that here. And it's amazing and beautiful and wonderful. So it's something to get really excited about. Um, another thing to watch out for is meaningless enablement. And what I mean by that is there will be a lot of people asking you to do a lot of things as your tools get popular, as your projects get popular, you will be asked to do all the things. If you, if you stick to your values and what you know your community needs as your priorities, and then add what you can after that, that's really gonna be the best approach. Because just going out and doing something because somebody asked, back to that upvote driven development, um, you may not be able to, to reach as many people or help as many people. So it's important to stay focused. Competition here is a bit of a double-edged sword in that con competition breeds the best kind of innovation. And it's great to have, but if you spend too much time or too much focus on the competition and not enough thinking for yourself, um, it can really work against you here. So instead of looking at the competition and say, oh, I have to develop that feature because they have it, listen to your users, engage them, understand that there's a reason we made these engineering decisions in the beginning, and there's a reason that we're continuing to make them. Understand what the users really need and listen to them instead of to whatever noise the competition makes, and it will really help you. You'll still need to set boundaries for yourself, and sometimes that'll look like changing things around in terms of the way you manage community um, and burnout as well. So, so looking at things like, am I still focused on the right things? Am I still taking the steps necessary? At this point, we were turning off the chatbots and directing people to the forum and turning down the mailing list and directing them to the forum because it was more searchable, it was a kinder experience, and we were able to address more people more quickly that way. So that's something to think about as you're going through here. What happens when the vote gets too big? So um, this was definitely the case for cloud providers and a couple of our other projects um, in terms of popularity. And, and we definitely had some community sentiment issues, especially in um, one of our Terraform providers where there were just so many issues and so many questions that were outstanding that it got to be too much. So we had to reevaluate our approach to community management and introduce what we called a technical community management team. Now this team comes in and they go through all the incoming requests and help triage to find the most important requests and get those in front of engineering. They answer some of the more simple ones and do things like um, provide issue templates and ask questions regarding the issues or ask for help with reproduction and stuff like that. And what it does is it gives engineering a bit of a chance to breathe because when you have over 4,000 issues on something that's inactive development um, and you're getting a volume of over 100 issues a week, it's easy to just do nothing but focus on the issues. If you do that, nobody's gonna be happy either. So finding a way to triage these things, prioritize the work and get deep into the metrics as a form of development is going to be the best approach. And that's that's what we ended up doing. We have a small team that supports um, four of our biggest repos today, and we do a lot of work with them um, to help with communicating with the community, but also figuring out 
how to influence the roadmap in a way that's going to be the most impactful for our community. So what does it look like when you're measuring and engaging at a massive scale? Uh, the challenges can be really no no noisy all the time, and it's easy to just get lost in them. So really taking a moment to refocus on your values and your identity as someone who's building this tool is important. Um, creating as many automated tools and systems as you can. So this can be Asana, this can be Jira, it can be, it can be all kinds of tools. We use GitHub projects to help with prioritization and triage. And I'll show you a picture of what that looks like in a minute. But we also have things running in the background um, for ticketing and different things. Um, for DAs, we started measuring them in something called impact hours, which I'll go a little bit deeper on in a moment. But essentially, it's a way to understand who's watching the content and how they're engaging with that, and if that is improving year over year. Um, in terms of conferences, it's looking at returning speakers versus new speakers. Are we getting new speakers? Are people wanting to talk about us that are new to the community? Is that is that um, is that growing year over year? We want we want a healthy growth in both so that we can continue to grow the community. So that's really important. And then we introduce something called open source health metrics. And this will help people kind of at a glance internally understand whether or not we are doing the right things by our community projects, whether they're um, MPL licensed today or BUSL licensed, we still use this health metric to understand if the projects are, are seeing the right level of engagement based on the things that we care about in response time and acceptance and all that good stuff. So I can't believe I'm saying this, but metrics can be really cool. And what I mean by that is, is this top, um, this top image here is actually one of our GitHub projects where we're going through and labeling the bugs. And the reason why we moved to a project-based approach is because we had such a massive number of bugs, it was hard to understand what the status was of each one that we were going through to triage as a technical community management team and understanding what phase in the life cycle it was in and actually getting a solution, because some of these are kind of tricky. So we went through and we built this, um, this project to understand and to help socialize all the work that we're doing and the progress we've made. And it makes a big difference in personal morale when you're the person doing this work, but also in terms of team morale in that the team can say, say, hey, we're actually making progress here and getting something done to help the community. Whereas before it felt like we were just in this endless hole and it was hard to find something to prioritize to help them. The other graph is impact hours by channel. Now, what you'll see in the middle is a bit of seasonality um, in terms of the work, but also a period of time when we had three team members out for parental leave, which was really exciting. But um, in general, we we engage with the DAs over impact hours. And what we try to understand is, is which forms we're using to help reach our audience and how much attention are we getting from our audience over those forums based on an individual piece of content? And is there balance in our approach to, to how we're reaching out? We want to make sure that there's a combination of written content, um, video content, in-person discussions and conferences to engage the community. And in order to do that, we use this kind of graphical approach and um, and weight the um, weight the individual um, items and allow for those things to be evaluated and put here so that we can look at a glance and say, no, for the most part, we're doing the right thing. This bump in August is due to a podcast that really took off. But for the most part, we have a balanced approach to how we're reaching out to people and how we're engaging with them, which is what we want to see in terms of enablement for the community. So what do you watch out for when things are so big? Well, the toxicity is still one of them. But what I'll say is when you have some kind of a toxic event at the stage, it's easy to feel like everyone is looking at you. And it's easy to kind of get lost in that. So to take a moment to look at what's happening, still call it out or, or try to prevent it as much as possible um, and encourage your community to do the same. But when you see the bad news hit, understand 
what impact that really has and use metrics and use um, things like impressions to understand what kind of reach it really has. Because one person complaining and shouting into the void is scary, but it may, it's not always the end of the world. So having an understanding of, of how to engage and what that engagement means back is important. Um, you're still gonna watch out for a lot of these things, but I'd say one of the biggest thing to watch out for here is echo chambers. And what I mean by that is it's easy once you get popular and once people love you, kind of the opposite of toxicity um, in a way is to look at things and say, oh, I'm doing awesome and I can keep doing awesome and everything is fine. But, but look out for some of those dissenting opinions too and really evaluate um, if there's merit to them or if there's a feature or something that you can build in to help those dissenting opinions because it's easy when, when things are going great to assume that they'll just keep going great. But a lot of times there's indicators inside those those moments in time that'll allow you to differentiate even further if you give it a chance. All in all, this is about keeping everything in perspective and trying your best to inspire and delight your community and help them inspire and delight others, which is why my team is here. With that, I'll say thank you all. If you need anything, have any questions or comments about this presentation, please reach out to me. I'll do my best to get back to you as soon as possible. Have a great time at the conference and take care. Thank you.